So what I want to talk to you about right now is we're going to continue our Planted series. I have loved this series because growing up in Alabama, I got to realize that, you know, you, you put things in the ground and good stuff happens, right? And so this Planted series has been revolutionary for me because I can understand it. And, and, and it, it makes sense. So we're going to continue that today. If you have not got a chance to catch some of these Planted sermons, they are online. I encourage you to do so. But I'm going to continue today talking about surviving drought. Surviving drought, right? Because there are those times in our lives where it, it just doesn't seem to go right, correct? There's just those times in our life where we're just wore out, we're tired, we're frustrated, things aren't happening like they should, and, and, and we're struggling, and, and we're in a drought season. So that's what we're going to pick up today. But I want to tell you a story about a sweet time in my life with this beautiful woman right down here on the front row. My wife is here with me. When the Lord decided to bless us with twins. <laughs> amen. She said, she said, Josh, we should have a third. And I said, amen. Let's have a third. And the Lord said, no. Let's give them two at the same time. And so the Lord blessed us with these wonderful, beautiful twin babies. And and. You guys that have kids, you know exactly where I'm going with this. Those of you that don't, I'm going to inform you, okay? <laughs> and we had this amazing pregnancy. Sarah gives birth to these beautiful babies, and we bring them home with us. And, and isn't that a funny thing, right? You're at the hospital, and everybody's helping you. They're changing the baby's diapers. They're loving on you. They're giving you bottles. Oh, I don't have this. Well, let me go get it for you. It's wonderful. And, and we're there at the hospital. And then all of a sudden they just go, you know what? You've been here for the last, you know, six months. You have to go home now. <laughs> we're like, no, we don't want to go home. We want to stay here. Our insurance will pay for this. And so they send you home with these beautiful, amazing babies. And they send you home just in time for them to wake up. Because they've been asleep the whole time at the hospital. And then they wake up. And you go home. And life happens. Well, my wife and I are intelligent people, and we understand what it's like to bring home a newborn. So we decided to call in the big guns, mom and dad. We called in grandma and grandpa, straight from Alabama. We said, hey, look, y'all need to come up here and stay with us so you can help us. Mom and dad said, yes. They're watching right now. I'm talking about y'all, mom and dad. And so they came up and said, stayed with us. We were, we were excited. And then it happened. Drought hit our family. We became extremely tired. We became overwhelmed. We became, why did we do this? What happened? Can we give them back? <laughs> what did we, because here's the point. What you guys don't realize is we had a five-year-old and a two-year-old running around too. That's three people in diapers. It's wild. And so we're, we're, we're completely overwhelmed. So I did what any good man would do, and I made sure that I had to work extra hours and went to work early. <laughs> I was like, baby, I got to go in early this morning. Okay? It's crazy. And so I go in the office, and about 10 o'clock I get a phone call. It's my wife. And she's doing this thing that's not okay because it's like halfway cry, halfway laugh. And it's like a, <laughs> and you're like, I don't know, I don't know what to feel right now. And as a man, you got to step back and you got to go, okay, judge the situation. How do I react? And so I'm like, hey, what's going on? Well, she begins to tell me this story. She has managed to go upstairs after just a week of the twins doing what twins do, which is rob you of life, love, and liberty and everything they can do. <laughs> and we're in a, we, we're wore out. We're frustrated, and it's, it's bad at our house. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? If you've had kids come home, and you're like, you know, why did we do this? And she begins to tell me this story. She gets the twins upstairs. She gets them fed. She gets them taken care of. She gets them where they need to be. And then she comes downstairs, and she's coming down our steps to smoke. The air is covered with a white haze. Of smoke. Now immediately my wife begins to react. Okay, the house is on what? Fire. The house is on fire, right? So she runs into the living room to see a five-year-old and a two-year-old having a baby powder rave. 
Both of them have baby powder in their hands in there. <laughs> Just powder everywhere. The, the, it is snowed in my living room. Completely. Now here's the best part about this. Well, Pastor Josh, where are the grandparents? That's an excellent question, okay? <laughs> the grandparents were living life in the living room, in the other room, drinking their nice coffee, having a great time. Not watching the beautiful babies. I'm, I'm talking to you, Mom and Dad. And Sarah immediately does what any normal, sane human being would do at that moment. She loses her mind. <laughs> and begins to just beat anything. Like she was beating the couch. She was beating any child she could get a hold of. She was crying. I even think my parents got a spanking that moment. I mean, it was bad. She was overwhelmed. Because isn't it funny? That's what happens in a drought, right? That's what happens in a drought. You get robbed of something. You know, honestly and truthfully, we talk about this now. At that moment, my poor wife, we, 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 the twins, we started remembering them at two years old. Because before that, we just blocked it out. <laughs> we just blocked it out. And so we talk about this now, and we're like... That is literally the funniest thing that's ever happened. What I didn't tell you is my sweet boy, Levi, who is amazing. He thought, you know what? In his five-year-old brain, th this is a problem. We probably shouldn't do this. So he goes in the kitchen and gets a bunch of water. And now he's mixed baby powder and water together. Seemed like a good idea, right? No, it was not. This was still waiting on me when I got home. And I stayed late. It was bad. But that's what will happen. Drought will pull your joy. It will pull your passion. Because we talk about it. Poor Sarah didn't realize it, that in that moment, that was probably the funniest thing that's ever happened to us and our babies. But see, that's what drought will do to you. It will it'll, it'll rob you of that. It will rob you of your passions. It will rob you of your zeal. You will just keep getting things done, but you just you don't have it anymore. You'll show up to church and you'll raise your hand and Pastor Curtis and Miss Charmaine are bringing this amazing song and the Spirit's moving and you're like, I, I don't feel anything. Why, what is going on in my life? It robs you. It robs you. You see, a drought is a prolonged period of abnormally low rainfall, a shortage of water. Drought is when you have to be replenished. Drought is the lifeblood of a crop. You see, I believe that most of us in here, or some of us in here, are just surviving. We're just surviving. We're just surviving life. That's where me and Sarah were. We were just surviving the twins. We were just surviving. And some of you are walking through life right now, and you're just surviving you're not thriving, you're not growing, you're not doing anything. You're, you're accomplishing task, but you're not going anywhere. And you feel numb. You can't sleep at night. You just feel numb because there's drought in your life. I'm going to tell you about a, a passage about Elisha. And I want to give you a little, a little history on the passage. And I want to explain something to you. Because a lot of you are asking me, or you're thinking to yourself, well, why am I in a drought? How did I get here? And so, Elisha is a prophet to this, uh, Israel. And Ahab and Jezebel are the kings at the time. And the Bible says that Ahab is a wicked king. And there's all kinds of horrible stuff going on. And the Lord brings a drought upon Israel. And Elisha is there, and, and or excuse me, Elijah, and he's trying to figure out, okay, how can I get them out of this? How can I get this to stop? What do I need to do to happen? What you need to first realize is why they were there. You see, they were there because of this. When you are thirsty, you will chase after what you need. You see, Sarah and I, the other morning, we were coming back from Alabama. And we were in what I like to call a caffeine drought. 
And so we drove, how many was it? I think it was 12 miles out of the way to order a grande blonde toffee nut white mocha <laughs> with an extra shot. Now, I'm telling y'all right now, some of y'all can make fun of me and say, well, I'll just have my coffee black, Pastor Josh. Well, I'm telling you, you need to have this coffee because it will change your life. <laughs> and so we drove 12 miles out of the way because when you need something to drink, you will do what you got to do to get it. When you need something to drink, you will chase after that. When you are thirsty, you will get something to drink. And so here's what I find is totally amazing. You see, God will not allow your life to be sourced by something that cannot sustain your life. God will not allow your life to be sourced by something that cannot sustain you. See, the children of Israel had found all other ways to take care of themselves. They'd found all other ways to chase, to do whatever they needed to do. And they had drifted away from God. So God, in an effort to bring them close, caused a drought. You hear where I'm going? You see, all through history, you know, tribes, anybody, what happens when they need rain? You see them kind of dancing around the little fire, praying for rain. They're trying to get close. They're getting close. And that's what I want you to realize this morning. Is that God has not necessarily caused all the stuff in your life. But I guarantee you, He is chasing after you. Wanting you to be close to Him. He's creating a situation for you to be thirsty. That's hard preaching. And that's tough to deal with. But that's the truth. He's making you thirsty because when we're thirsty, we will chase after what we need. He is calling you back to Him. You see, something needs to change in you before your circumstances will change around you. Something has got to change inside before everything will change on the outside. So I'm going to read you a little bit of this scripture. It's in 1 Kings 18, 41 through 46. It says, Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elisha climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his feet between his knees. Then he said to his servant, Go and look out to the sea. The servant went and looked, then returned to Elijah and said, I don't see anything. Seven times Elijah told him to go and look. Finally, the seventh time he said to the servant, I see a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Then Elisha shouted, hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. As soon as the sky was black with clouds, a heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah he tucked his cloak in between his in his belt and ran ahead. Ahab's chariot ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. You see, I want to pull three things out of these passages that I believe Elisha did to end the drought of Israel, and I believe they're keys to ending the drought in your life. And number one is this: the first thing Elijah did was he got along with God. He got along with God. It says, So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elisha climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. I'm going to ask you a serious question. When's the last time you got on your knees and you prayed about your situation? You know what? I'm not talking about I'm on my way to work. Let me hit a praise and worship song and let me get five minutes before I get there. I'm talking about getting alone with Jesus. I'm talking about getting somewhere where you can find him, where you can hear him. The kids aren't screaming. The spouse isn't asking you to do the honey list. The work isn't calling. The stress isn't there. And you can get away and you can say, God, I need you here right now in this situation. You see, Elijah climbed to the top of a mountain. He climbed to the top of a mountain to get to where he could be close to God. And it says he bowed down with his head between his knees and began to pray. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at this and I'm going, what? What does that even mean? God, why are you putting that in there? 
Why does it say he bowed down on his knees and put his head between his legs to pray? So you guys should have seen me the other morning. This 6'3 guy was on the floor trying to figure out what yoga move Elisha was doing. <laughs> All right? And I'm sitting there and I'm like, God, why, why, why is he doing this? And God told me something. He said, you know, Josh, he said, what are you experiencing when, you, when you're in this position? It means I can't see what's going on around me. I can't see what's going on around me. I can pray and I can ask God to do it. But when it ain't there, I can still keep praying. I can still keep going. I can still keep pushing. I can still keep following God. And I don't have to sit there and look around and say, well, the rain isn't coming yet, so I need to stop. When's the last time you got in a place where you could fervently seek God? You see, God isn't interested in our shallow devotion. You know what? I love life groups, and I love coming to church on Sunday. But I believe the Lord wants a little bit more than just that from us. He's not interested in our shallow devotion. He's not interested in, I'll just give you this much, God. He wants you to go all the way in. If you want out of the drought in your life, you've got to seek him fervently. That means you've got to jump in. You know, my dad, my dad used to teach me when I was a kid. You know, I, I hate cold water. I hate it. It's awful. When you get out of the shower, you're supposed to be red, just burnt, hot. And I remember going swimming as a kid and just, you know, you walk up to the water and you're like, Woo, no dad. My dad's favorite thing in life. Come up behind you and just push you in. Son, you got to go all in. He loved it. That's what I'm saying to you today. If I could spiritually get behind you, I'm going to push you all in. I'm going to push you all in. You see, look at this. In Jeremiah, he wrote, he said, For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. Your ability to survive tough times depends on how deep you're willing to go with God. Your ability to survive your drought depends on you and how deep you're willing to go and how deep you're willing to go. Number two is you have got to expect supernatural supply. You got to expect it. You got to expect God. You got to raise your faith to a level to expect, you know what? I, I just believe He's going to do it. You got to believe something is happening when nothing is seen. You got to believe it. You know, I love this. Some of us are in those nothing is happening moments, right? You know how it feels to raise kids. You put all this time and effort into them. You put all this love into them. And they still go to children's church and get in a fight. <laughs> right? Or you love on your teenager and you're pouring into their life. And the next thing you know, they're walking further away from God than you ever even imagined. Something's happening when nothing is seen. Or how about your spouse? You're being nice to them every day. You're trying to increase and improve your marriage, but they're still being mean to you. Something is happening when nothing is seen. You see, it's the place where, you, where what you see is in direct contradiction to what you sense. My mama, son, it's going to be all right because I, I just sense the Lord in that. Mom, are you kidding me? The Lord is not in that. Son, I just believe, I just believe that God is in that. I sense something amazing. You have to be able to sense it and know it, even though you can't see it. Even though you can't see it. Even though you can't see it. You have got to keep going. You've got to keep going. You know, I love that part of the scripture. And it says, seven times Elijah told him to go back. Seven times. If you're expecting supernatural supply, you got to keep going back. Even when it's not there. 
Even when your husband's still mean to you, even when your kids are still doing something awful, even when the finances don't look right and you've been tithing and it's not working, you keep going back. You keep pushing. You keep looking for faith. You keep seeing it. You keep going. You keep going. If you're expecting supernatural supply, listen to this. King David said, the righteous would enjoy abundance in the days of famine. God doesn't want you to fail. Even when it's dark around you, he's got a plan. Even when it's not working, he's got a plan. You see, you've got to raise your faith and expect a miracle. You've got to raise your faith and expect a miracle. And then the last one, number three, is this. You need to celebrate the insignificant. You need to celebrate the small. And it says, finally, the seventh time his servant told him, hallelujah, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, hurry to tell Ahab. You need to start celebrating the small stuff. If you want to get out of this drought, you need to celebrate the fact that it may not be the job you want, but you got a job. It may not be where you want to be in life, but you're on your way. you got to learn to celebrate the small things. you got to learn to celebrate the fact your husband got up and he made you coffee. He may have hollered at you at lunch, but that morning he made you coffee. You got to start celebrating the little things. When you start seeing God doing things in your life, you celebrate them. You're excited. You're passionate. Here's why. Here's why. Because the devil's only plan at that point is to distract you from what he's doing. That's the only way he can win that battle. Because now God is moving in your life. The drought is starting to end. You see a little bit of rain in your life. And then all of a sudden... He wants to distract you from what he's doing. It's kind of like this. I believe the Lord wants me to have a blacked out Jeep Wrangler. Okay? He does. That's what he wants me to have. As a youth pastor, I need this. Okay? It will improve my credibility. I'll be like, hey, look at that youth pastor. He's got a Jeep Wrangler. Oh, cool youth pastor. I don't even have to preach. Now, any of you that would like to just help my wife out with that, please inform her that you've heard from the Lord after this sermon. But that's what I need. And so I made this decision in my life. I'm like, I need a Jeep Wrangler. Guess what happened? Jeep Wranglers started showing up everywhere. Everywhere. It's like everybody, everybody had a Jeep Wrangler driving down the road. There's Jeep Wranglers. There's 14 Jeep Wranglers in the car. Google tracked me because I was looking for them. And now Jeep Wranglers are on the sidebar of everything I look at. Jeep Wranglers everywhere. Why? Because my attention became focused on that. You see, you have to keep your attention focused on the small, insignificant victories because they're not insignificant. They're important. They're a step in the right direction. They're a step where he wants you to go. They're a step of coming out of drought. You know, there was a time in my life where I, I experienced some, some crazy, crazy drought. My wife and I were living in Texas, and it was just time for the Lord to do something different in our life. And I was doing what any normal uh, man would do, and basically pitching a fit. <laughs> just pitching a fit the whole time, you know. Just being, I, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to follow God. I'm not happy with where I'm at. You know, crying. Any, any, any wives got a husband that does that? Is that a, no, don't, don't raise your hand. Never mind. I'm creating drought on Memorial Day by doing that. And it was just a rough time for me. I was leading worship at a small youth group, and, and I remember just singing songs to the Lord and not feeling anything. My sweet marriage was struggling. My my finances were awful. I was constantly tired and my health was down. It was just a rough season of life for me. It it, It was just so dry. And what it was, it was the Lord was trying to get us to move from Texas. Because he had a plan for me. 
He was trying to convince me to be in a different place. And what he wanted me to do was seek him. So there was drought in my life. And I began to just seek the Lord and, and do some of these things that I've been talking about this morning. And Long story short, we end up leaving Texas, moving to St. Louis, volunteering in the youth group, becoming the youth worship leader, and then becoming the youth pastor. See, God's got a plan. He had a plan for me. He had a plan for me, but he, but he, needed, he needed me to, to submit to his plan. He needed me to follow after him. You know, I'm, I'm going to read you this last part of this. And this is one of my favorite parts. It says, the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. See, what you don't realize about that is that's 17 miles. The average chariot is about 40 miles an hour. Elijah straight up outran a chariot and ran 17 miles because, get, hear me, God will give you supernatural strength to overcome your problem. He will give you supernatural strength to get to where you need to go. He will give you supernatural strength to make it make it you know I was praying about all this and, and, and getting ready for this just wonderful opportunity and, and what I realized is that there's a lot of us that are in a drought season in our lives we feel numb to things our finances aren't where they should be our kids are acting crazy our spouses are going nuts job's not where where we want it to be and we don't know what to do we don't know where to go but I can promise you if you'll do these things if you'll seek the Lord if you'll expect supernatural things and if you'll celebrate the small insignificant stuff he will pull you right out of that he will bring the reins in your life. He will put you on track to where you need to be. And he'll grow you beyond measure.